please welcome to the stage, Chris Bryant. Friends, how are you doing? My name is Chris. A lot of people get confused as to what gender I am, which I get it. You look at me, you're like, is that a beautiful gay man or like a woman's tennis champion? <laughs> I am non binary, but you can use whatever pronouns you want for me he, she, they. I go with whatever. I go with whatever pronouns people give me which I learned specifically at the, at the grocery store that the pronouns people give me are just ma'am. <laughs> which is very interesting. I'm just like, why am I being called ma'am? Like, I'm never dressed up when I'm going to the grocery store, you know what I mean? Like, I'm usually just like in sweatpants and like no bra on. <laughs> I'm like, why am I being called ma'am? Is it just like my slender body or just like all of the LaCroix in my cart? <laughs> so much LaCroix. <laughs> um, I feel like at this point, I am just a stereotype of a millennial. Like if there was like a millennial bingo, my entire card would just be full. It would just be like, non-binary, on the autism spectrum, gluten-free, had ass parents for money, doesn't know where to buy stamps, bingo! <laughs> Whole thing. I, I am on the autism spectrum. Uh, don't applause too loud. Uh, <laughs> I am on the autism spectrum. I actually found out later in life, it, it hit out on me for the longest time because I would say brutally honest things at the wrong time and people would just be like, oh, they're just gay. <laughs> like what I'm trying to say here is like, there's a very thin line between like, do they have autism or is that just a bitchy queen? <laughs> Are they on the spectrum? Or are they just spilling the tea? <laughs> like I would just go up to someone at a party and be like, hello, your shoes are dirty. Did you grow up poor as a child? And people would just be like, oh shade. Oh, you read her. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to connect. <laughs> Being on the autism spectrum and non-binary, I feel a lot like an alien. Uh, like I don't understand people. I just tend to like watch them from a distance. Also, I keep anally probing them at two in the morning. <laughs> That's the first butt sex joke of the night. Buckle up, buckle up. A lot of my friends are stoners. Where are my stoners at? You guys are quick. Sometimes it takes you guys a few minutes to respond. I'm just happy about that. I love my stoner friends, but I went on mental health medication at the beginning of this year, and they were all super worried. They're like, oh my God, you're going on Prozac? Like, aren't you afraid that's gonna become addictive? I'm like, you're literally lighting weed with a blowtorch right now. <laughs> it's 7 a.m. Chad. Um, I just, and here's the thing, weed is amazing. It's incredible and it can be, it definitely should be medicinal. I really think it should be. But if we are going to make weed medicinal, I need some of you guys to be like a little less fucking weird about it. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, don't name your medicine things like purple train wreck, you know? <laughs> like, people on antidepressants, people on SSRIs, we don't make it our whole fucking personalities. <laughs> you don't see me with, like, Zoloft socks. <laughs> and, and, like, an SSRI phone case. I mean, what? <laughs> Like, what's that? Like, we don't have, like, I don't know, like, antidepressant buddy comedies. 
Like, I don't even know what that'd be, like Seth Rogen and just like Jonah Hill, just called Lexa Bros. <laughs> Two guys making stable decisions, but they can't come. <laughs> Coming this fall by two guys who can't come this fall. <laughs> I don't know, I desperately need a vacation. Have any of you been to like one of those all-inclusive resorts in Mexico? A few people, yeah. So I went with my queer friends and what I didn't realize when you go to these all-inclusive resorts is that like 90% of the people that will go there are like, people from the Midwest who are Trump supporters, right? <laughs> so there was one day I was um, waiting for my friend for dinner and I was at the resort and this guy looked up at me. He jumped up and pointed and said, oh look, a real life faggot. <laughs> yes, that's not the funny part, but thank you for laughing. Uh, <laughs> you're good. It was, it was weird, it was horrifying. And I was just standing there like, what do I, I was angry, but I was like also scared. But then I started to look at his face and he was just like filled with joy. And I was like, oh no, like he's just really excited to see a real life faggot. <laughs> So I was like, oh no, now I have to be like the faggot representation for this entire vacation. Have to do things gay now. Which is like eating, I don't know, eat like tacos in a gay way, which is just like without the hard shell and no meat and no cheese. And it's just a margarita. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, recently got invited to a girls' night, which is very exciting. Yeah. White, drunk girls, drunk on rosé, very similar to me, sober with autism. <laughs> like, apparently, it's just like appropriate to just start crying in the middle of the girls' night. Like, my friend Samantha started crying because she missed her boyfriend. I started crying because I didn't like the way my leather boot touched me. <laughs> and she was very drunk and she was just like, oh my God, I would feel like I was born in the wrong generation. I wanted bell bottoms. And then she was like, Chris, what generation would you want to exist in? Which is a very fucked up question to ask a queer person, okay? Like, as a queer person, there's very few generations we could exist in. Like, for us, it's either, like, ancient Greece or after Glee, A.G. <laughs> That's it. And I thought about it, I was like, if I was to be born in any generation, it, it would be now. Like, I feel bad, but I see the youngest generation with their, like, iPads and nut allergies and, like, gay couples becoming prom king and queen, you know? And, like, I'm happy for them. I am. Like, this is what we fought for. But I'm also slightly pissed off because I know that I missed the window of happiness by this much. <laughs> Like, if I went to school in 2022, I'd just be like, I'm queer and I'm on the spectrum and I own this school. <laughs> it would just like be me. My best friend would just be in a wheelchair. I'd be like, Ludwig, EpiPen. These light up shoes aren't gonna walk themselves. And we would be the bullies. We would run shit. I'd be like, hey, Give me your lunch and tell your mom to pack it gluten-free next time. <laughs> I've got IBS, I take no BS. Ludwig, let's roll. <laughs> I have a very interesting relationship with my mother. I recently had to explain to my mother what shade is even though she invented it. 
My mom's great though. She um she recently left her church of 22 years because they had a vote against LGBT people from being involved in church. And after they voted that way, she left her church of 22 years. Yes. It's amazing. But now she's almost like a friend who's like going through a breakup. Like as soon as she left, she's doing unhinged things. Like the day after leaving church, she got bangs. Yes, bangs. Like she's texting me unhinged things at like two in the morning. Just like, I want to go back. I'm like, no, you are a strong, independent parent and you don't need no church. She's burning. She's burning all of her ex's things. So if you see a bunch of crosses burning in the middle of North Carolina, that might not be the KKK. That might just be my mom supporting her LGBTQI child. She's been trying to get me to go to these like affirming churches, which are just like churches that don't hate gay people. And she got me this book that's titled how to accept your LGBTQI child without losing your faith. And it's a journal. And she like expected for us to like journal together or something like that. And I think she thought my journal entries were just gonna be like, even though I was born with this hideous curse. <laughs> But really, they were just like, well, today I got fucked outside of a 7-Eleven. Also, I need milk, question mark? And I was just like journaling together. Like, I, I don't want to be rude, but mom, are you trying to make me more gay? Like on the levels of gayness, it's like Liberace, glory holes, tandem journaling with your mother. <sighs> Things are good now. I'm in a relationship. Give it up for love. My boyfriend, uh, for one of our first dates, he showed up and was wearing the most adorable tank top and cargo shorts. Yes, cargo shorts which was a really shocking way to find out that he's bisexual. <laughs> this makes lots of sense. Um, we are having excellent sex, thanks for asking. I know that's what you were all worried about. Um, we're having good sex. I think the thing is, is like lately I've been into like daddy son role play. Like my sexual fantasy is just like a hot older man being like, good boy. And I'm like, I don't have a gender dad. And he apologizes and we both cry and he pays off all my debt. <laughs> we recently shot a reality show. Uh, um, I can't say the name of the show, but it's about people who are in love, who are on the autism continuum whatever that show may be. It was the most traumatizing experience of my life, and I grew up as myself in the Bible Belt, okay, people? Here's the thing about reality TV. I'm just gonna get into it. Reality TV, first of all, you have cameras in your house all day. Like, they're following us all day. And it made my boyfriend and I feel like we were like, almost like we were back in college and we had a bunch of roommates. Like we were pretending that they didn't exist and they were pretending to not listen to us have sex. <laughs> Turns out nothing makes me come like hearing someone change a camera battery. <laughs> the thing about reality TV is like, it's not real, you know, it's very staged. But when you're filming it, you're trying to make yourself think that it's real. I almost felt like a method actor where the character that I was trying to play was myself. Every day I was just like, I'm Chris, but I'm also Chris, but I'm also Chris. I need everyone on set to refer to me as Chris. <laughs> 
Reality TV does not pay. I did not realize this. I don't mean like doesn't pay a lot. It does not pay anything. And what happened is like, the producers tried to like recruit us to get on the show as if we were doing a donation. It's almost like they were televangelists asking for like a donation for their God, which is Hollywood. (laughs) They're just like, Chris, as a low budget docu-series with just some of the highest views on a top multi-billion dollar streaming network, We have no money to pay you, so that's why you must sacrifice a donation of your time, space, and emotional well-being for your fellow (laughs) they-dash-dim. And just like with God, by the end of it, I was like, is Hollywood even real, you know? (laughs) They, when you go through these, like, I don't know, these reality shows, you have to go through, like, months and months of, like, uh, background checks. And their main thing is they just wanted to make sure that, you know, they weren't hiring getting one that has previously done porn. And at first I thought it was weird, like, oh, they just don't want sex workers because it will make the network look bad. Then I realized that they just didn't want to hire people who are used to getting paid to be fucked on camera. (laughs) The show, like the show when it starts, it starts with like a disclaimer. Are autistic people are given lots of breaks and they're given free therapy. We were given no, no breaks. And our free therapist was just a script supervisor saying things like, I'm afraid we've run out of time. (laughs) Also like having a disclaimer, it reminded me of like when Hollywood has disclaimers for like animals. Like, yes, we shot a puppy out of a cannon, but it was safe and it was the puppy's idea. Disgusting. (laughs) When you're shooting these shows, you get like notes from the network while you're filming it, which is very bizarre. One of the notes that we constantly got from the network was that we were too sexy, which was the only note that I agreed with. Um, (laughs) Very much so. And here's the worst part. After like months of filming, months of background checks, we got an email and they cut us from the show. Yes, no pay, nothing. Thank you. Thank you for feeling my pain. They sent us like this like email that was like, due to the algorithm, we have to cut the cast in half, which was a very like autistic reason for cutting us. I was like, (laughs) but now, It's terrible. Now I look at this network almost like an ex that broke my heart. Like I canceled my subscription to the, you know, the service. And when they asked like, what was your reason for leaving? It was like I was leaving like an ex, a drunk email at 2 a.m. I just like, you stole the best weeks of my life. And you seem to have just moved on fine without me. My mom asks about you every day. I bet you don't even think about her. (laughs) Hey, here's something for your consideration. Fuck you. (laughs) It's been making me think a lot about like my previous relationships and breakups because it was really traumatizing to me. And I'll end with this story. Um, My worst breakup was with an actor. Um, everyone could go, oh, there. Cause yes, it was a huge mistake. Please don't date an actor. <laughs> the tipping point was he invited me to his friend's theater play, which uh, ended up being a four hour production <laughs> of 12 Angry Men, but like with an all female cast. <laughs> And it was halfway through sitting this that um, I realized that I was in an abusive relationship. I just, I don't think adults should be allowed to put on plays, okay? Children in an auditorium, that's cute. But like adults in a black box theater in like the middle of North Hollywood when there are more performers on stage than audience members. It's sad. It's like watching a stripper bend over to pick up just like a couple of dollar bills. It's sad. 
And here's the thing, like I love like movies, even movie names are like Die Hard or like Apocalypse Now. But every play name is just like Sylvia's Basement. <laughs> or like A Hat Full of Rain. They're like rejected Bath and Body Work candle names, people. <laughs> And then like after sitting through like four hours of this stuff, then you have to like, we had to take his friend to dinner afterwards and validate her for another hour. And she was just like, who's the best actress of the play? Who's the best actress of the play? And I just wanted to be like me for pretending to like this shit. So in a terrible fate, um, I, uh, I feel like Breaking up with an actor is very dramatic. It almost makes you feel like you're in a soap opera. So what I would like to do is I have actual text messages from my ex <laughs> actual text from my ex-boyfriend, and I would like to read them to you in a dramatic monologue. I would like to read them to you in a dramatic monologue in the voice of Joan Collins from Dynasty. Christopher, you must not tell lies. Do not make it seem like I demanded money from your parents. No, that was simply a gesture from your family side. No, we can't talk. No, that sounds like you want to manipulate the situation further. I'm opting to stay out of it. I'm just hoping I can do damage control for all the lies you're telling. <laughs> four years, four years and I'm losing everything. You can take the house, but you will not take the wig collection. Maybe it's best we don't contact each other. I mean, you can obviously contact me over logistical matters if it's 100% necessary. <laughs> Like when you clicked going on Shant's Kickstarter launch party. I did not respond and this is page two. I hope you know I was the first to be invited. You're just being rude. Power move noted. Again, no response. I woke up at five in the morning and after a brief and minor panic attack, I'm feeling stronger than ever. I really hope you get professional help soon. You're really losing touch with reality. I honestly wish you the best of luck. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your night.